Now we're going to go back to cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, so if we can have the next slide, please, Laura. And this time, Sam Cook is going to talk about a Rothamsted Rotham perspective on IPM for cabbage stem flea beetle. Over to you, Sam. All right. Good morning, everybody. OK, next slide, please, Laura. <laughs> Love your backdrop. Thank you. I want to see more of this. <laughs> Right, OK, so cabbage stem flea beetle, as you've heard from Steve already, you get two pests for the price of one with this species. So the adults can threaten crop establishment by feeding on the leaves and the larvae. They mine the stems and they go up to the growing point and kill it, um, causes increased branching, increased susceptibility to disease and yield loss. So big problem. Next slide, please. We've got a long history of cabbage stem flea beetle research at Rothamsted. When I first arrived in the, the 1990s, my supervisor, Elspeth Bartlett, was working on, on this species at the time. And she was working on feeding and showed that glucosinolates, the presence of those and sugars induced feeding in this species and that there was a potential sex pheromone. Unfortunately, the occurrence of pyrethroid resistance in um, pollen beetle um, meant that she couldn't continue her work because of funding shortages. All of funding was diverted to pollen beetle. So next slide, please. So 20 years later, here we are, and we had the um, revocation of neonicotinoid C treatments, plus the occurrence of cabbage stem flea beetle resistance to pyrethroids, as we've heard earlier, which led to massive crop losses, these big fields of, of nothing but bare soil. Next slide, please. 25 years later from that research, and we have got massive decrease in the area of all seed rape grown. We're now back to sort of the area where we were 20 years ago. And we're unfortunately in the situation where we're needing imports, um, ironically, from countries that are allowed neonicotinoid insecticides. So we're learning to grow all seed rape without um, insecticide input really. Next slide please. So IPM strategies might help in this in this learning to grow all seed rape without insecticides. As you've heard from Steve you can actually have an IPM strategy just with insecticides. If you set the action thresholds and you monitor and then you spray the um, actives when the control thresholds have been exceeded that counts as IPM but we really do need these other um, strategies in this system to make it more robust. We need preventative methods um, that stop the problem occurring in the first place and we need other controls other than insecticides. Next slide please. So I'm going to try to tell you about where we are with those other, other strategies. So action thresholds currently for flea beetle um, you should spray if more than 25% of the leaf area is eaten or if you exceed five larvae per plant. So student Duncan Coston at Rothamsted tested the all seed rate physiological response to leaf area injury and infestation with flea beetles. So he um, damaged the plants with um, um, a, a, a leather punch to control it, the damage and he in artificially infested um, plants with, with larvae taken from plants outside in the field. Next slide, please. And he showed that a really high leaf area injury, 90% removal, did not impact the productivity of all seed rape. So we really do need more research to understand why we're seeing this crop loss in the field. And we had a question earlier about plant health. It could well be something to do with that because our plants were in pots. They were nice and healthy throughout their growing phase. But he did see a response when 25 cabbage and flea beetle larvae, or but, but not five, were introduced. So plants were clearly shorter, they produced less flowers and pods with lower oil content than the other treatments. So we can read from this that the larval threshold might be too low, but it does range somewhere between 5 and 25, and larvae are damaging. So I know that there's a lot of early sowing strategies out there at the moment just to avoid the, the, the adult damage. And these must be used with caution as this increases the time for egg laying and larval development. So I think we've got to sow at the right time, not necessarily just early. OK, next slide, please. So monitoring 
currently, you know, you've got to get on your hands and knees and crawl about in a muddy field and look at to see if 25% of your leaf area is damaged, which is really difficult to do quickly and accurately. Or you've got to monitor with yellow traps, which requires some element of identification skills. Next slide, please. So there are tools out there at the moment that can automatically estimate the leaf area damage and can automatically um, identify the number of insects and the species in, in those traps. Next slide. And at Rothenstead, we're trying to now investigate the pheromones that Elspeth started in her work um, for more effective and species specific um, trapping strategies or maybe lure and kill strategies in the future. Next slide, please. I'm really excited about the potential of using optical sensors for real time on automatic detection and monitoring of pests and beneficial insects in the field. So the idea is that there's a there's a kind of a, a laser beam or a light beam through which insects fly through and they are detected. Next slide, please. We created a database library of these traces from insects that we collected in the field. We recorded them thousands and thousands flying through the beam or we know which ones they were the signatures are split into training sets which are then used for machine learning and evaluation sets so we, we ask the machine can you tell us if this is a flea beetle yes or no and we found that we've got 80 to 95 percent accuracy in determining flea beetles and other Aussie grape species from from other targets next slide please we looked to see if this worked in the field um, on flea beetles and we did find that the activity and abundance of insects were detected by the sensor correlated nicely with trap catchers. Next slide, please. So a kind of vision of the future is a tractor or drone mounted apparatus that can enable areas that only have high densities of pests to be sprayed um, and maybe where beneficial insects are too low and can't do the job. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thanks. So prevention, let's do all we can to prevent the problem in the first place. Well, the best way to do that is by using cabbage stem flea beetle or pest resistant cultivars. There are no pest resistant cultivars of all seed rape currently available. There's quite a few for diseases and resistance to lodging and all that sort of thing, but no, nothing for pests. So we really need to, to, to work on this and, and get them commercially available. We have found variation in feeding responses to different lines of, of brassicas in our studies at Rothamsted. But you can see on the left um, in the field, we got quite a lot of variation. But when we took those same species into the lab, we got a different answer. So um, we've got to really work out what's going on there. Um, interestingly, John Innes, uh, Rachel Wells group there have also found variation in lines and we've put a joint proposal together. So fingers crossed, please, that we get this funding and hopefully we'll be able to bring forward the development of resistant cultivars. Next slide, please. Um, companion planting is another way of preventing the problem in the first place. There's things like um, Intercropping, and here you see Piola, which one of our EcoStack partners is trying um, in Germany. We've got trap cropping, which you see in the centre there, where a very attractive plant is sown around the area or um, in adjacent to the main crop, or under sowing, and there you see some vetch being sown at the same time as, as all seed rape plants. Next slide, please. So we've tested quite a few of these companion planting strategies. I've started this work many years ago um, in 2005, actually on pollen beetle. Um, but we looked with a student to see what happened with flea beetle. So back then, turnip rape trap crop borders really did significantly reduce the number of cabbage stem flea beetle larvae in all seed rape plots that had the turnip rape controls. So 10 years later, Duncan student tried again and we found the same results that turnip rape trap crop borders did reduce the flea beetle feeding and larval um, damage. And you can see on the left, we just about had some plants in the middle of that turnip rape trap crop and there was nothing on the right. In, in that year, we had very high levels of flea beetle damage and in the end, the whole, the whole trial was lost. Next slide, please. 
So Duncan also tried companion planting under sowing. This is quite um, increasing in popularity in farmers. There's many reasons for doing it. Um, it improves soil structure and may be able to reduce weed problems. But we wanted to look to see if it could help reduce flea beetle problems as well. We tried under sowing with mixed brassicas and mustard in a clear field strategy and this worked really well but we found the timing of the companion plant removal really difficult and you know it can go horribly wrong if you don't get that right. Um, we've tried under sowing with bursine clovers, wheats and oats and we found that these do have sometimes really great if effects but they do seem to be inconsistent. So we need to understand about the mechanisms of success. When it works, why is that? We're starting to wonder if it's just because of the dilution effect. And indeed, if you do increase your seed rate, then you do uh, decrease your damage. But maybe there's other mechanisms at, at play, so dilution or host location or disruption or repellency effects, which we are now looking into in the EcoStack project, um, which has been led by Gaetan Simandi Corda. Next slide, please. And lastly, we come on to control. I'm thinking we're now moving into an era where we can do this without insecticides. There are some, there's some work on biological insecticides. I do have my concerns about the selectivity of these, but I think biological control is, is the way forward. It's the use of agronomy and habitat management methods to conserve those natural enemies that are there already in the agri-environment to make them do the pest regulation job for you. Some work at Rothamsted when I first arrived showed that carabid beetles, um, one in particular Trechus, had a very close spatial association with, uh, with flea beetles and did show really great biological control potential. Um, in our EcoStack project now, we are looking to quantify the role of predators in pest regulation and the effect of com companion crops on those. Next slide, please, Laura. Um, we've got PhD student Patrioti Ramos, who's looking at parasitoids. Um, Turculotus microgaster was uh, the main larval parasitoid of, um, of cabbage stem flea beetle. We found it for the first time in the UK in 2005, back in our trap cropping studies. Patri is now looking at the spatial distribution of this species across the UK. Um, using DNA metabarcoding and manual dissection tools. And she's looking at the agronomical drivers of the variations that we're seeing. So how can farmers um, learn to increase the density and abundance of this parasitoid species? Next slide, please. There's also an adult parasitoid, um, which was <clears throat> first reared by um, Andrew Ferguson at Rothamsted, um, attacks um, the adult phase, um, Patry found that um, the eggs are laid inside the host, they develop and the, the larvae come at the backside of the beetle, which is delightful. Um, they bury themselves in the soil, they make a cocoon and it um, has pretty good control. So up to 30% parasitism rates are found across the UK in, in Patry's early studies. So fingers crossed for this species, looks like it, it's, it's the best hope we've got at the moment of killing the adults. Next slide, please. So how can we support natural enemies, populations in the agri-environment? Well, they are susceptible to pyrethroids, as you've heard from Steve. We are, we are doing a survey to see how many of these natural enemies are susceptible to pyrethroids. A lot of them are, so please spray only when necessary. Um, the larval parasitoid, um, Tersilocus microgaster, is actually most active when you're going to spray for pollen beetle. So, you know, don't spray for pollen beetle if you want the parasitoids to do their job for your flea beetles. Both the adult and larval parasitoids pupate in the soil in these cocoons, so minimum tillage can improve survival. And provision of uncultivated habitats near your crops um, can help to improve survival and maybe the provision of pollen and nectar resources from flowering margins and we're looking into this um, more in our eco stack and assist projects that we're running right now and i think that's it next slide please so how you can help us continue this effort? Well, we're looking at the effect of field boundary features and the natural enemies that they support on crop yield. 
So we need your help. If you use GPNS enabled combines, please can you share your yield monitor data with us? Um, and as you've heard, our companion planting experiments are very highly controlled and uh, give us robust answers, but they could suffer from neighbor effects and it's not what you know, you're, you're doing in your field. So we need to scale up these trials. So please get in touch if you're willing to host a trial. Um, and thank you very much for listening and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thanks. OK, yes, thank you, Sam. Um, we've we've got a little bit of time, a little bit behind. Um, I've got an echo on my voice, which is really annoying. Anyway, we have two questions which I think are very linked. Um, one from Steve Moss, our old friend Stephen, uh, but also from Chris Coates. It says the current oilseed crop in the grounds got had the lowest number of flea beetles so far, which I think everyone is observing, and that stimulated a new interest in the crop. Are there any theories why these numbers are so low? Has it is it the ban on the near nicks that's meant natural predators have done a better job? There's there's lots of reasons why it could be. Yes. Yeah, we we we've observed the same thing, but we we've still actually lost our crop. <laughs> um, we sowed at the wrong time. Um, natural enemies could be doing a better job, and Patry has seen an increase actually in parasitism levels. Um, so if we're not taking out our natural enemies, then they will be doing a better job in the field. It could also be due to um, the temperature um, and we had a lot of rain, very, very wet rain and flea beetle eggs certainly don't don't like the rain. So I think the wet weather that we had also um, contributed a lot to that. But yeah, we, we, we so need it to might not be we get away with it again this autumn is what we're saying, isn't it? Every year is different, isn't it? But yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, Another quick one. Great. Are there any pointers? This is from Bill Langford as to why some brassica crops are more attractive to cabbage stem flea beetle than oilseed rapies. Um, yeah, so turnip grapes really attractive. We think it might be because it's very bright green, so it might be a colour thing. It could be due to the glucosinolate profile as well. Um, um, maybe hairs. There's there's quite a lot of different factors that that could influence sucrose as well. Sucrose um, they like sugar like we do, <laughs> so um, there are many reasons why. And this is part of the, the the plant breeding project that we are that we're looking to 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 um, find the mechanisms of of the resistance and the if we've got a resistant plant and a highly attractive plant, then we can look at the differences between those. OK, I'm going to take one more. Um, there's quite a few coming in. What uh, this is an anonymous one. What would be your cost effective recommendation to today's growers to cope with the resistant beetles? Oh, I think the clues in the cost. Yeah, <laughs> the cost, <laughs> cost effective. Um, it's a mean question. If you're in a if you're in an area that's got cloddy soil, um, that in a hotspot area in the southeast, think twice about growing it. Um, we haven't looked particularly hard into the economics of trap cropping and under sowing. Um, so I, I find that really difficult to answer. Yeah, sure. I was, um, I, I was mean to pick that question. I think yeah. I think it's very hard to answer. I will that say, though, uh, a lot of growers don't want to put inputs on too early because they think, well, if I'm going to lose it, there's no point doing that. And we have found, you know, the healthier the plant, the better it's going to do. So sometimes those early th those early inputs actually do pay off in the long run. OK, thanks, Sam. I'm going to have to move on. Apologies to people who ask questions that didn't get fitted in.